iView. Today, 16 people treated for carbon monoxide poisoning following an exhaust leak at an Adelaide ice rink. The coalition says it will wind back the government's new right to disconnect laws if they win power. Israeli airstrikes kill dozens of Palestinians in Rafah ahead of a possible ground invasion. And three things in life that are certain. Death, taxes. <laughs> Hello, welcome to ABC News. I'm Lorna Dunkley. SA Health says more than 20 people showed symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning after attending the Adelaide, Adelaide Ice Arena last night. But all will make full recoveries. Reporter Imogen Hain has the details. Several hockey players have been treated for carbon monoxide poisoning following a tournament at Adelaide's Ice Arena. Adelaide Rush was competing against Melbourne Ice at the Theberton Arena last night when several players reported having headaches and feeling unwell. Some presented at the Royal Adelaide Hospital in the early hours of this morning. SA Health and the Metropolitan Fire Service was alerted soon after. Firefighters recorded high levels of carbon monoxide at the scene and have since determined the cause to be the arena's ice resurfacer, which runs on LPG. The incident is believed to have been isolated to the change room the Melbourne team were using before the game. Crews remain at the building while it's being ventilated and cleared for use. Manager Richard Laidlaw says he has spoken to several players who have been discharged from hospital. I've been getting reports from uh, from SA Hockey and uh, from and they actually called past in the minivan after being at the hospital. Uh, they're more concerned about getting their gear out of the building at the moment. But uh, once this is all resolved and they've got their gear, I'll give their manager a call and check that everyone is fine. The ice arena is expected to reopen once the carbon monoxide levels return to zero. The ice arena says no staff have reported feeling ill, but anyone who is concerned should seek medical advice. A man has died at the Southern 80 water ski race on the Murray River on the New South Wales-Victoria border. Paramedics were called to reports that a man had been seriously injured while water skiing at around 10 o'clock this morning at Moama. He died at the scene and is yet to be formally identified. New South Wales Police are investigating the circumstances and want to speak to anyone who has video footage of the incident. This footage is file vision from previous year's events. Shadow Treasurer Angus Taylor says the coalition will repeal several measures of the federal government's workplace relations reforms if it wins the next election. The opposition would seek to undo laws that will allow workers to ignore unreasonable out-of-hours communications, as well as multi-employer bargaining agreements. Mr Taylor says the coalition would instead focus on improving productivity to reverse the decline of people's living standards. Behind that collapse in living standards is an unprecedented collapse in labour productivity in this country. This is not the sort of the grinding challenge the world has had with productivity over many years. This is a collapse of 6.1% in labour productivity in the last 18 months. Now, if that's the case, people can't be paid more on a sustainable basis. This is an important part of the reason why standards of living have collapsed. Mm. We have to get back on track here. Well, that was the Shadow Treasurer Angus Taylor speaking to David Spears on Insiders this morning. He also says the coalition will oppose vehicle emissions standards that increase the price of popular cars. Most popular vehicles in Australia are the Hilux and the Ranger, and if any vehicle prices are going to go up, it's, 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 going, to be, it's going to be those. Let's be clear about that. Mm. Uh, and if you look at the documentation carefully, you will see there's penalty provisions uh, that they're proposing of $100 per gram kilometre, David. Now, uh, for a Hilux and a Ranger, that is a very significant penalty, and the idea that customers won't end up paying that, you've got to be kidding. Opposition leader Peter Dutton says he will speak to Barnaby Joyce this week after the MP was filmed lying on a Canberra footpath late at night. Mr Dutton says he was only aware of what had been made public, but notes Mr Joyce had already spoken with Nationals leader David Littleproud. Speaking to Sky News, Mr Dutton suggested someone should have stepped in to help Mr Joyce. It's pretty rough when people are walking past somebody who might be in need of support. Uh, I understand that a chalk mark has been drawn 
on the footpath. Uh, could only happen in Canberra where all those Greens and Labor staffers are. But uh, I'll have a chat to Barnaby this week. And as you said, uh, David Littleproud spoken with Barnaby and he's going to speak with him as well this week. And uh, uh, that's where the situation's at at the moment. Israeli airstrikes have pounded the southern city of Rafah just hours after Israel's Prime Minister announced plans for a ground invasion. At least 44 Palestinians have been killed, including more than a dozen children, in multiple attacks. Successive evacuation orders have packed more than half of Gaza's 2.3 million residents into the region. And now there is almost nowhere else for them to go. Israel claims that Rafah, which borders Egypt, is the last remaining stronghold of the Hamas militant group, which was behind the October 7th attack. Israel plans a ground offensive, have drawn sharp criticism from Egypt and Qatar, and have increased tensions with the United States, which has warned of a potential disaster. A six-year-old girl who went missing in Gaza City last month has been found dead, along with several of her relatives and two paramedics who tried to save her. The Palestinian Red Crescent Society say Hid Rajib had been travelling in a car when it came under fire. Today it was Hope that died, long after six-year-old Hend was killed. She survived the gunfire that killed her uncle, aunt and cousins as they fled Gaza City in the family car. Her calls with the emergency services as she hid among the bodies of her relatives in sight of Israeli tanks sparked a campaign to find her. Today, as Israeli forces withdrew from the area, paramedics went in. They found Hen's body with those of her relatives in the shattered car. Her mother has been waiting for her daughter at a nearby hospital for almost two weeks. For every person who heard my voice, my daughter's pleading voice, yet did not rescue her, I will question them before God on the day of judgment. Netanyahu, Biden, and all those who collaborated against us, against Gaza and its people. I pray against them from the depth of my heart. Near where Hend was found, the ambulance car that was sent to get her, the bodies of its two crew members inside. They were deliberately targeted, although our ambulance have very clearly the Red Crescent emblem on top of our ambulances, and we had it clearly also on all sides of the ambulance. We asked the Israeli army about this, but received no response. Elsewhere in Gaza, Israel's bombardment is intensifying. In the southern border town of Rafa, three officers from the Hamas-run police force were killed in a strike on their car. And funerals were held for seven adults and five children, killed in overnight airstrikes on their homes. This town, the final refuge for Gaza's civilians, the final target in Israel's ground war. Three people have been killed in a head-on crash in northern New South Wales. Emergency services were called to the New England highway near Armadale after seven last night, where a Holden SUV and a Mazda SUV had collided. Two people in the Holden, the 27-year-old male driver and his 27-year-old female passenger, died at the scene. The 41-year-old male driver of the Mazda was also killed. A 34-year-old female passenger was taken to hospital in a critical condition and a two-year-old boy who was a backseat passenger is also under observation in hospital. One car somehow crossed onto the incorrect side of the road. Uh, once again, uh, which car it was is still under investigation um, and we'll have more details of that as the days go past. I don't know what caused that crash yet. Um, but over the last 36 years, every crash that I've been to, somebody's done something wrong. Someone's made a poor choice that's resulted in tragedy on our roads. There's no such thing as an accident. 
Victoria Police have shifted their focus in the search for a missing Ballarat woman after search crews were called off yesterday. 51-year-old Samantha Murphy hasn't been seen since she left her Ballarat home for a morning jog last Sunday. Police are asking anyone from the Ballarat East Mount Helen or Buninyong area with CCTV or dash cam footage from Sunday to come forward even if it does not feature Miss Murphy. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese was in Ballarat earlier today and says his thoughts are with Samantha's family. It is, has been, uh, I'm sure, just such a difficult time. And I thank all those people who are involved in the search and hope that it has a, a, a good outcome. Uh, but I thank those who are out there working uh, every day. Two more tobacco stores have gone up in flames in Victoria, but police are only treating one as suspicious. A car was torched after it was rammed through the front window of a shop in Seville, east of Melbourne, just before two o'clock this morning. The offenders fled in a waiting car. An hour later, firefighters were called to a tobacco shop on Chapel Street in Melbourne's inner southeast, but police say that appears to be a case of misadventure. Victoria's regional wet rail network is advising commuters to plan alternative transport tomorrow morning due to another statewide strike. As part of their dispute over paying conditions, V-Line operational staff will be taking four hours of industrial action from 3 a.m. V-Line says there'll be limited replacement buses until about 8 a.m. with significant delays expected. A former military general accused of human rights abuses and the fatal kidnapping of activists is poised to become Indonesia's next president. 72-year-old Prabowo Subianto is the clear frontrunner for the presidential election taking place on Wednesday. More than two decades on from his alleged crimes, the perennial candidate is riding a wave of youthful support as 200 million people prepare to vote. On a hot afternoon in the city of Semarang, Prabowo Subianto is working the crowds. No stranger to election rallies across this archipelago nation, Prabowo, as he's known, is in his fourth straight campaign. Almost every poll says that we're going to win in one round. But let's not be careless. Let's not be complacent. This time around, he's reinvented himself to tone down the strongman image that failed to propel him to victory in past elections. Political elites in Jakarta often scold me for being rude when I talk. I am a former soldier. This is just the way I am. I don't do sweet talk. I don't talk in circles. Straight talking, which seems to have won the support of many young voters this time around. Yeah, the gas. Prabowo is firm, honest, wise. Prabowo is extraordinary. He has diligently and consistently run for president, despite having failed a few times. Many weren't even born during the most infamous period of Prabowo Subianto's past. In 1998, as the regime of Indonesia's autocratic leader Suharto was crumbling, the special forces, then under Prabowo's command, kidnapped and tortured 22 activists. Nine survived and returned. 13 were never seen again. My son was very active. He didn't want to see injustice happening before his eyes. Payun's son Utok is among the 13 activists who were never found. Because it's been 25 years, I just want legal certainty on what happened and the whereabouts of my son. Prabowo Subianto has made comments over the years acknowledging involvement in the kidnappings of the nine who survived. He said circumstances were different and he was defending the nation. But he's now more dismissive. They accuse me of doing this and that, a coup plot, abducting activists, killing them, etc. Well, what can I say, huh? This is democracy. If people believe those accusations, simply don't vote for me. He's never admitted or been directly linked to the missing 13 and their presumed killings. He was, however, dishonourably sacked from the military for his tactics. Whatever happened back then, Prabowo should not be president. Once he's in that role, our search for answers will be over. There's no more hope to fight. 
Payan and the families of the other victims for now maintain their search for answers. Monthly protests outside the presidential palace calling for these decade-old cases to be properly investigated. Despite promises to address human rights cases, outgoing President Joko Widodo has made little progress in 10 years. Now his son Gibran is Prabowo Subianto's pick for vice president. The youthful running mate is helping recast the former soldier's image to a new generation with a cute and cuddly style. It's not position that I'm after, it's not rank that I seek. I just want to see the people prosper. If Prabowo Subianto can win at least 50% of the vote, then this tilt at the top job will be third time lucky for him. If his two rivals combined can prevent him winning a majority, then he'll have to go to a runoff in June. Prabowo and his team are desperate to avoid a longer campaign for a runoff poll and they're increasingly confident they'll seal the victory in one go this week. Bill Bertles, ABC News, Semarang, Central Java. Teenage dads can face the challenges of stigma and isolation while also managing their own physical and psychological changes, and all the while they are caring for a child. The number of young dads has risen, and while they're still only a small percentage of the population, there are calls for more support for young parents to break the cycle of intergenerational disadvantage. Anton Gower had just turned 19 when his partner Taylor fell pregnant with their son Eli. It was a real big surprise for both of us, but a happy surprise. Put up a good job. Whoa, big step. But he felt the Get stigma of being a young dad. Yeah, high five. You can just tell what they're thinking, like, oh, are you sure that's a good idea? Or mm, it doesn't seem like he's making the right choice. Can I have that one? Anton has no regrets. But along with the joys of parenting, there have been challenges, like finding somewhere to live and paying for essentials. Sometimes we can't afford to pay power for the three months, so we have to set payment plans, and that means we have to pay $100 a fortnight, which means less groceries. The number of teenage parents has remained steady in recent years. Young parents are more likely to live in regional areas than cities, and there's been a rise in the number of young fathers. While numbers are low, experts say support for young parents is crucial to break the cycle of generational disadvantage. If we don't support young parents to be really good at what they do and be able to really support their, their child because they've got the education and they've got the services, then that young child is going to be disadvantaged. The Brave Foundation has started a program to mentor young dads. They have faced um, stigma and isolation and judgement and so it's been really important for them to have access to a, a supporting person, a trusted guide who can walk alongside them and encourage them in their parenting journey. Ready? No. The organisation has helped Anton enrol in a teacher's aid course, a path he's hoping will help him realise yeah. his dreams. Just make sure AI grows up having a good life. That's my, that's my goal. Fiona Blackwood, ABC News. An historic gold mining town in North Queensland is now home to the largest handmade mosaic mural in Australia. The colourful creation is a finalist in the Australian Street Awards and hopes to lure more travellers to Charter Towers. Stretching 80 metres long and 7 metres high, this roadside creation is hard to miss. But take a closer look and you'll discover more than 5 million tiny tiles telling the tales of a town's gold mining time. Not only do we have an incredibly rich history to Charters Towers, uh, we've got somebody willing to tell the story in such a way, it's, um, I don't think, we'll find, you don't think you can find anything like this in regional Australia. Artist Trisha Lambie spent nine months on a series of paintings recreating historical photographs. Her vision was later converted to massive mosaics. I had to sort of immerse myself in that history and bring it to life. Gold put Charters Towers on the map in the late 1800s. The town was once the second largest in Queensland. 
Historian Michael Brumby dug into the archives to help bring the mural to life. Unlike a painting on a, on a wall, it'll be with us for hundreds and hundreds of years to remind us of the history of, of Charters Towers. The work pays special tribute to Jupiter Mossman, credited with first discovering the region's gold. It was a terrible storm, lightning all around, and it spooked the horses, so Jupiter was the one who had to go and find them, and in doing so, he found the gold. The mural is a finalist in the Australian Street Art Awards, with the winners to be crowned in March. Victory or not, the mosaic's real success will be in its ability to stop traffic. This is, of course, one of the busiest roads in North Queensland. If you, can get, if you can get people to stay just for an extra couple of hours, it's beneficial to your town. Lily Knopfling, ABC News, Charters Towers. It is time for the sports news now. Here's Daniela Intilli. The Australian Opals have qualified for the 2024 Paris Games after beating Germany 85 to 52 in their Olympic qualifiers in Brazil. Australia has thrashed South Africa by 110 runs to clinch victory in a rain-affected final one-day international at North Sydney Oval. The host set the Proteus 278 after an unbeaten 82 from Beth Mooney and 60 from captain Elisa Healy. South Africa needed its largest ever successful run chase to seal a series win, but four for 26 from Alana King and three wickets from Kim Garth meant the Proteus were bowled out for 127 in 24.3 overs. Australia's 2-1 series win over the ODI means the world champions now hold an unassailable 8-4 lead in their multi-format series ahead of next week's one-off test match in Perth. Yeah, absolutely. Look, it's been a really good um, six games of cricket, I think. Um, certainly challenged us. I've been really proud of the way we've bounced back after sort of being one each in, in two of the sort of mini-series, I suppose. So I think we've um, we've bounced back really well, played some, some good cricket, but they've certainly challenged us and, and taking a, a win off us in, in both formats. Liverpool has returned to the top of the English Premier League with a 3-1 win over Burnley at Anfield. Diogo Jota, Diaz and Darwin Neues scored to put the Reds two points ahead of Manchester City. Reigning champions at City sitting in second after beating Everton 2-0. Erling Haaland scored a double and his first goals since November. Elsewhere, Tottenham moved back. Obviously scoring last minute, uh, you have those kind of... <coughs> Yeah, you know, mixed feelings of joy and also, as you said, relief. Um, right. Still, first half we 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 kind of lacked those things. Um, second half was better. You know, we put them under more pressure. We played a little bit cleaner with our football and uh, ultimately got the uh, got the rewards. Sydney FC have ended the Mariners' 12-game undefeated run in the A-League men's with a 3-1 victory in Gosford. Sky Blues defender Ryan Grant opened the scoring in the fourth minute. Midfielder Anthony Caceres scored against his former club before a Mariners' own goal made it 3-0. It should have been 4-zip had it not been for a stunning miss from Patrick Wood. The 21-year-old failed to capitalise from a blunder by the Mariners' goalkeeper Danny Vukovic. The result moves the Sky Blues back into the top six and just five points off the second-placed Central Coast. Elsewhere, the Brisbane Roar thumped Melbourne City 5-1. In the A-League women's competition, Perth Glory has drawn 2 all with Canberra United in Perth last night. Days after being recalled to the Matildas squad, Michelle Heyman scored a double for United and her 106th career goal. Elsewhere, the Central Coast Mariners drew one all with Melbourne Victory. The result keeps the Mariners in seventh, while Victory moves levels on points with the fourth-placed Wanderers. And in Melbourne, the game between Sydney FC and Melbourne City was delayed after Sydney's team bus went to the wrong venue. It finished nil all. The Wildcats will automatically advance to the NBL playoffs after locking in a top two spot with a 117 to 88 victory against the Cairns Taipads in Perth. Reigning MVP Bryce Cotton led the way for the Wildcats with 26 points and four assists, while projected number one NBA draft pick Alex Sarr had an impressive 14 points and 12 rebounds. Patrick Miller top scored for the Taipans with 25 points. 
Fans from both the Kansas City Chiefs and San Francisco 49ers are getting ready for Super Bowl 58. Supporters partied at a fan zone ahead of tomorrow's showpiece event. Reigning champions, the Chiefs, are playing in their fourth Super Bowl in five years. The 49ers are aiming for their first Super Bowl crown since 1994. Taylor Swift is expected to make the epic journey from Tokyo to Las Vegas to watch her boyfriend Travis Kelsey play. Another win for Kelsey's Chiefs would cement their status as the NFL's newest dynasty. Looking around the country in Queensland, isolated showers and thunderstorms in the west scattered on the peninsula. In New South Wales and the ACT, widespread showers along the north coast and adjacent ranges with moderate falls. Isolated showers elsewhere along the coast and eastern ranges. In Victoria, a dry and sunny day with above average temperatures across the state. Partly cloudy in Tasmania with possible showers. South Australia, dry apart from isolated showers in the far northeast. Showers and gusty thunderstorms over most parts of Western Australia during the afternoon and evening. And in the Northern Territory, a medium to high chance of showers and heavy rainfall over most of the state. Looking ahead to tomorrow's forecast for the capital cities, possible showers in Brisbane, Sydney mostly sunny, fog then sunny in Canberra, sunny in Melbourne, Hobart will be mostly cloudy, sunny in Perth and Adelaide, and there'll be a possible thunderstorm in Darwin. And that is the latest from ABC News this hour. Remember, you can keep up to date at news.abc.net.au and also on ABC iView. I'm Lorna Dunkley. Stay with us now. Australian Story is up next.